Most of Bernie Sanders like the idea. He put it in very minimal. Kamala Harris, I mean, certainly upper middle class. But yeah. I don't know what's, why. What's that? Really? Like, 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 a couple years ago, a bunch of seniors came in and put Shakespearean insults all over my um, It was a pretty good frame, so it was just covered, and that there's just a few left. There's still a couple of maps. All right, this is back to this. A DBQ. So, shh, a DBQ. So don't forget, you're not summarizing documents. In fact, you will be docked if you summarize the documents. Operate under the assumption that the person grading you, a.k.a. me, Knows everything in the documents, but then knows nothing else. So you have to show how the documents will reinforce your argument. So the if the essay question is about, let me throw one out. What caused the session? And you want to talk about like points of view, like the free soil point of view. You use the document to show the free soil point of view. We use the documents to show the state's rights point of view in the South. Or the um, fear of John Brown. Things like that. Use that document to reinforce your points. And please, you won't summarize. I gotta say that over and over again because people will. I want to summarize it. Don't you want to kind of prove you know what's in the document? Try to get over that, especially a picture or a painting or a political cartoon. Don't describe it. Only show how it reinforces your argument. Yes? Um, I really, like, I'm probably right, like, the positive good theory and stuff like that. Are the documents going to be, like, as hard to comprehend? So? Well, you know, some will be, you know, from that from different era, so you have to filter through them. But they're all, if you look at the DDQ I gave you today, the one I gave you, that's the sample. So the one I gave you that has a what cost of session on top, the one I gave you today. That one I gave you today, not the sample one. That one, there are about the length of the documents. Some are really short, some are longer. You turn the page, there's, a, it's a diary from George Temple that's strong, it's a little bit longer. You know, not, hey, you're not, I, I can't guarantee you understand or not understand. Uh -huh. But you have to go through it, read it carefully. Some will be really easy to understand. In fact, you probably be able to guess where the document's coming from. I'm just reading the book. Okay. Like a Democratic platform, you, or I'm sorry, the Republican platform for document one, you probably have a pretty good idea what point of view. The Southern Democrat, you probably have a pretty good idea where it's coming from. So, the documents are there for to reinforce. It's still your essay. So you still got to construct and think about writing in an essay in your own terms, just adding the documents in. Now, there'll be some things you have to do that I don't think they're bad, so I do it, but they also will help you with the college form of the APS. You know, I don't teach to the test. I can't think of anything worse. Because then what can you do with it? Yeah, I don't take the AP exam. You, you, you do use that for the rest of your life. But I'm going to do things like, you know, help you take the test. You know, so I can do things where they overlap and I'll help you. So let's look at that. Keep the uh, document out, but look at that writing the document based question. I lay out the basic format, which is about the same as writing an essay. What's the first thing you do? Read the question. Answer the question. So if it's answering the question, let's look at the DBQ I gave you. And so the DBQ is about secession. The first bullet points you notice that, those are the things that, and I took that directly from the college form of what they want for an essay to give you an idea. That would be at the top of the DBQ. And basically, those words, they made it slight changes for those basic things. That would be on top of the DBQ for the exam, too. And then do you see the question? Does everyone see the question? Hmm? No, that's not the question. That's just the question. Yeah, was it? The question is evaluate that statement. Was the ultimate cause of the Civil War sectional differences over slavery? By the way, we know this. I know I'm going to say something. All of you should know the answer. What are the sections? Time no, is up, right? Civil War, was it about slavery? You have to know those basic elements. So you basically have three choices. Oh, well, three choices. You can agree with it, you can disagree, or you know, basically agree, but there's also, you're going to add like one other part. But there's also economic differences that might have caused it. Or you can agree totally and give me reasons why it was slavery. Or say, no, it's something totally different. So, read the question, and you must address civil war, sectionalism, and slavery in your thesis and for the, your essay. 
You understand what I mean by that? And then the next thing you do, don't read the documents yet. The next thing, do a brainstorm. 10 to 15 facts about that time. Jot them down as quickly as possible. And the reason why it's simple, when you read the documents, you need context to understand them. Remember I told you that before when you read documents. Try to think about what's going on historically at that time. So it's not just words. So your mind is in tune. You're already thinking about those events that led up to secession. In fact, think about a brainstorm list. What was that compromise that said California free and popular sovereignty in Utah and Nevada? What was that compromise? Say it again. So compromise 1850, put that down for a brainstorm list. What was the war? Say it again. Mexican-American War. What was the proviso that said no slavery in the territories? Wilma, what uh, What was the law part of the Compromise 1850 to return runaway slaves? Fugitive Slave Act. What was the book about the anti-slavery book that would be banned in the South? Good. What was the political party created out of the Kansas-Nebraska Act? Republicans. Free Soil Party was already there. Free Soilers became Republicans. Free Soilers became Republicans. And uh, let me think of another one. Those are all, see all those events all? You go all the way to Dred Scott, all the way to the election. Those are the kind of things you get down. So when you read the documents, you have context. They're not words. If you read the documents cold, you will miss things. And the other good part about it is you do a brainstorm list first and then go back and read the documents. Go through the documents and trigger more memories. Things you might have forgotten when you go through your brainstorm list. When you read it cold, it's like you basically have to relearn every single time you read a document. And trust me, you do not have enough short-term memory. Neither do I. So get it in as much as possible so you're thinking about it. So read, so you do brainstorm, and then read the documents. So everyone got that? That's the third step. Your mind is already set. So let's look at that first document I gave you. Document one. By the way, sometimes they will be this short. Everyone read document one of the DBQ I just gave today. Document one, and what does it say? What does it say? Oh, by the way, remember you read the Republican platform first. First, you have already, have, already have a pretty good idea. What is the point of view of this document? What does it say? Where? Does it say that? In the territories. So what is the point of it? What do we call that idea of no slavery in the territories? That's free soil. That is the free soil point of view. It's not abolitionist, is it? Abolitionism is getting rid of slavery. The Republican platform was no slavery where? And that's free soil. So you notice I give you room, space. Underlying key parts of it, because remember, you're not summarizing a document. You're looking for key facts that you think you can use in your essay. Key parts you can use to reinforce your thesis. And then jot down a couple words so you don't forget. Because how soon will you forget what's in document one? Yeah, document two, document one's not, right? I, it'll come back. But what do you need to write down? Write down three swaps. Now you know. So you don't need to reread it over and over again. You already have a pretty good idea. You underline the point you need. So when you're outlining, boom, you know exactly where you want to go. So that's what you do for all of them. You can probably guess what document two is. What is it? What is the term I gave you? More and more became pro-slavery. Say it again. I couldn't hear you. Well, don't base. Well, base was in northern support of the South. What is it? These are southern Democrats. Filibusters. Filibusters are people who want to start rebellion. I know there's so many words. There's two words. It sounded like it wanted more freedom for the individual states, but it was actually pro slavery. Remember what that was? You remember? Huh? The Board of Revenues from Missouri. I know all the terms. You're right. They're pro slavery people. They're, and by the way, that's a good one. Yeah. Fire readers are pro slavery too. Popper sovereignty was the vote. Oh, people want to start. People want to start rebellions in Central America. Here, and, and so we don't forget. And hopefully, when I say it, you'll remember. States' rights. States' rights is code for pro-slavery. 
That's what that position is. By the way, does it say in the document? No. If you want to talk about the seven position, you talk about stage rights and use paraphrase, no quotes, paraphrase document two. That tells you the seven position. So you're going one paragraph on the north, one paragraph on the south, or one paragraph on the Republicans or the Democrats, or one, or one paragraph about the election. You do all kinds of things with it. But that gives you the position. So read the documents. Then you write your thesis. Then you write. Wait till then. And the reason why, you might think about a way you want to answer the question, but you have to be practical. you got to get documents in there. So you might have to structure it in such a way so you can use as many documents as evidence as possible. Make sense? When you take, make, take the position of the question, which is about slavery, sectionalism, and civil war, take your position, and then the blueprint. Remember that A, B, and C, which would be the topic sentences for your paragraph. Yeah. In fact, I'll tell you this right now. Yeah, they really don't know. The reason why is they look at it as if you're just copying words. That means you really don't know how to answer the question. And you're still in space. But you do have to cite it. If you use it, you cite it. And I'll tell you how they, they want it. It's, it's an easy way to cite it. But one time in your essay, you can use up to a five word quote. They look at it as let's say you're writing and you're like, oh, I have no idea. I'm going to build space. I'll just copy words. That's a red flag. I know it might be different than other ones you have, but for this one, use your own ones. Did everyone catch that? So no quotes, right? Everyone got that? Okay. And then thesis and then outline. Yeah. One five-word quote. That's basically all the quotes. Or they look at it as we want limited number of quotes, but we'll allow for one. And so we eliminate it each kind of around five. So I just I just set you no know, I just make it a five word quote. So you know you you take out a few of the words and, just, and like that little phrase just works perfectly use that. So don't copy it. Use your own words to show how it relates to your thesis. And then outline. And the outline. The thing about outline. Same deal. Brainstorm. Work on your thesis and then have your outline. And I will let you have an outline when you come into class on Thursday. You can have brainstorm outline and thesis. I will collect it. I'm not going to go through and look at it with a fine tooth comb. And I know you're, I want you to use your shorthand abbreviation. It's for you. I just want to make sure you're organized. That's all. That's all I want to do. So you can come in with it and then start writing on Thursday. And so here's an example of one from a previous uh, one, a previous essay. It's about the Industrial Revolution. We've seen this. Brainstorm a bunch of stuff. Thesis, and then here's an outline. Capitalism's in the uh, thesis, and then it has a few things, facts that you add in, wage system, facts, second grade awakening, facts. But then you'll notice there's a letter next to them. What's the letter? Hmm? The document. Sometimes they designate the document as letter, sometimes document A, or sometimes document one. So those are the documents. So document E, we talk about capitalism, we use that, paraphrase that in the sentence showing how it uses document E. And so that's a pretty handy little one, way to look at it. The documents you want to relate to something you know, you know that will be used for your thesis. To defend your thesis. Remember, it always has got to go back to your thesis. And then, one more thing, you know, the stars. There are a few of the documents you have to add an additional sentence of analysis. Additional sentence. So let me do that right now. We'll come back to this. But turn over that sheet. I'm writing the DBQ. Just I'm writing the DBQ. On the back are the guidelines that the college board gives. And these are pretty good. I think it's a good way to do it. So I use it too. So we've already done this with the thesis. It's a seven point scale. Thesis one point, just like a regular essay. Contextualization, one point. Remember, that's in your opening paragraph. Big picture. That opening paragraph should be, all, should be about four to five sentences. Three of those sentences should be context. What's going on at that time? If the question's about secession, you talk about events in the 1840s and 1850s that led to it. Industrial Revolution, Manifest Destiny, Mexican War. 
Now, let me tell you a hint about contextualization. Remember the brainstorm list? Big list of things, right? You're not going to use all of that in your essay, are you? A lot of it. You're going to use a few things in each paragraph. Either relating really to documents or just your own information. For contextualization, use the ones you don't use for your body paragraphs. If you're not going to write a paragraph on the Compromise of 1850, have briefly mentioned that in your sentence for contextualization. If you don't have anything about the Mexican War, briefly mention that and Texas annexation, how that led to sectionalism. If you don't have, and you might not have the Kansas Nebraska Act, add that, or the creation of the Republican Party, add a few of those things, put that in your contextualization, and then you have a good background. The person reading it goes, okay, I know where you're going, I know you understand the time period, and you might get that point. Let's be practical, right? So, next, right? Why right, do we shut the door? <laughs> so with that, what else do we need? Okay, let's look at the next thing down. Describe three of the documents. So that's using three of the documents to reinforce your point. <laughs> now, I don't care if you're in the hallway or not. You do not touch my door. If you can knock on it and ask, do not touch it. Now, if you're asking, I'll do it. But you don't tell me what to do. Yeah, that's a little bit. I know they're going to know. But back to this method. So, use three of the documents. Three of the documents. You get one point. Three of the documents. Yes. How, so, would you just say, like, I? how would you put that in text without quoting it? Okay, well, you're just simply going to say, okay, that the Republican platform is about free soil. So just simply say the Republican platform shows the free soil position of the Republican Party. And then you would just put in parentheses document. Doc one. Okay. At the end. For three. For six, you get two points. So one point for three, one point for six. Catch that? So you must have. Hmm? Let me back. You get one point if you get three documents in this row. You get two points total. So you get one additional point if you do six. How many is that percent per paragraph of the body for the body paragraphs? Two. No documents in your opening paragraph. No documents in your opening paragraph. No documents in your closing. Use it only in the body. Now, if you get six, you get two points for six. How many should you do? Yes. Um, six. yes. Thank you. You're leaving? <laughs> no, nah, nah. I don't think anybody else wants me to yell at them. But how many documents should you do? Six, seven, seven. You have time, get seven in. So for one of your body paragraphs, try to use three. If you're running out of time, only use six. But why seven? Hedge your bets. Maybe one won't work. And then look down the next one. You must add one additional sentence or half. One additional sentence. And half, you must show historical content, audience, purpose, or point of view. One of those four. Remember, that's why I had you do point of view or purpose for the positive good theory of slavery. Just to think about it. The purpose of the Republican platform was 
something like that. Or their point of view. Well, their point of view was their free soil and they're opposed to the expansion of slavery. Their purpose, they knew they were only a northern party. So they want to rally free soil in this election. Something to that effect. Add an additional bit of analysis. Or list down a couple additional historical events that are happening. Like, for example, about the bleeding Kansas and popular sovereignty in Utah and New Mexico. And the, so the fear of, the, of slave power. Give a couple examples. So you need one more additional sentence for three of the documents to get one point. So for six, you need one sentence that's showing how it explains the position for three more to get another point. So how many should you do if you have time? Four, if you have time. Just head your best. If you're starting to run out of time, just do three. And that's what you have to do. And if you look at that sheet I gave you, it shows you a little bit of how to do it. Look at that sheet I gave you before you left on Thanksgiving, the one with join or die on it. So, Ben Franklin's for the Albany Planning Union. And so basically, here is one with half. Yeah. You can have it on the test. I'll, I'll let you have that out. I'll let you have, uh, well, obviously, you can have the documents and your outline you bring on, on the uh, first hand. So, literally, when you walk in, starting up, what, the bell was like 12 35, is that right? Mm -hmm. So, 12 30, once you get at 12 30, I'll let you start. Once you get here, you can start writing. Sound good? Thursday. So, join or die. This is about the Albany Planning Unions. Friendly attempt to the colony to provide a unified front to the British. Okay, so I, I list out the basic ideas of what it was. So, that's how we use it in a sentence. And then I add half. Additional point of view the Albany Plan proposed by Friendly and others would have created an intercolonial assembly that would have power over intercolonial trade. So, that's outside context to show what it was. By the way, it didn't fail or it failed. And I forgot to put that in the one I gave you when I typed it, so I added that. Wouldn't it good to be put down the colonies were too brittlely divided to unify? But that's how we use it in the sentence. Now you notice two things. First off, I'm just reminding you that's historical content. You don't need to put that part there. But that's how you document it. Does everyone see? So if you have one sentence, we're going to shout it. One sentence. Put it after the first sentence. If you use two cents for a document, put it after the second. So doc one or doc two. Just put it at the end. Put it in parentheses at the end of the sentence. At the end. They will literally count off the documents. Yeah. So does it, do you cite? Okay, do you only cite document after you have or after facts, like paraphrased facts? Every time you use paraphrased facts from the document. Cite it because you're going to use basically kind of facts from the documents when you describe it because you're only using them once and you only use a document once and so you just do it at the end whenever you use that document in any way. Cite it. And you notice one more thing I put down here. You notice that? I put down two, but right before you do the half that sentence, put a little star right next to that first word. Just a little star. Help the person reading know that this is some an additional bit of analysis to try to get that extra point. Just put a little star there. So this is, I'm going to add that additional analysis. Let me give you another example. Let's go down to, let's go to this one. Declaration of Independence. We've read it, right? So, you notice how I started the sentence about this. Do not start with in document forward. That's improper, it's awkward. Write down the Declaration of Independence or the Republican platform. Or George Templeton Strong's diary, that's article, that's document five in yours. Lay out the British were infringing on the rights of the colonists with the language of John Locke's social contract. There. I gave outside information. I did not define the document. I laid it out the fact that this was an event leading up to the revolution. And then I added a little bit of half. This is purpose. Audience purpose and British are the same thing. That British made defense, made purpose was to attempt to convince the colonists to unify the revolt against the British monarchy. That's how you document. Yeah. Do you have to underline the citation? You don't have to. I just wanted to make sure that it was very obvious. You know, I've had people say they want even a box. The big thing, just honestly, parentheses at the end. 
Not in the middle of the sentence. It's got to be in. It just one of those weird kind of uh, just stop. Yeah. Did you say that you Yeah, only once. Yeah. Yeah, each use documents only once. To and you won't have time to use them much more than once anyways. And so six documents or seven, that's how you outline. And so then what do you do after your outline? Write. Five paragraph essay. That's it. Organize it, go through, make sure you jot down things for the documents. Yeah. You want to underline the thesis too. Please underline the thesis too. Underline your thesis in an essay. Underline your thesis. Remember, you're trying to make the person grading life easier. Can we only write on the front side? Yeah, please. It's my core. This is our actual DBQ. That's it. That is the DBQ you have. And a couple more things. A couple more things. Like I told you, no quotes. What about personal pronouns? Yeah. No. Don't write. We went to the civil. We went to the war. No, we didn't. We weren't alive. <laughs> right down the United States. Don't think. And you might have rights down the road. Like me, thanks. Go write it, citizen or whatever. You know. Right. And I know in conversation we all do that. I mean, not literally we. But out of, in essays, you out of habit doing that for all your essays. Even for opinion, they ask you an opinion. Write it as fact. Get used to doing that. It makes your art, you make your essay significantly stronger. And don't forget transition between paragraphs. If you, have, if you have to skip on any paragraph, skip on the closing of the kind of essay. Oh, and you have to get up your own outside information too. So outside information, your own knowledge of it. So make sure you get as many facts, examples, evidence as you can. So like another additional one in a couple of sentences, something outside of the documents. Something outside of it, bring in. You know, the documents don't really talk about Kansas, Nebraska. Maybe we can pull that in a little bit more. In a way, I know these are a little bit harder because you're used to talking, but they direct you and point you out. They give you hints. They really do. So we get these pieces of paper and the mm -hmm. Okay, so on Thursday, you're going to have that. Sound good? Yes. You don't know about Festivus? Right? For the rest of us, people. And by the way, no tinsel. No tinsel. No, I, so I've done this, gosh, for eight or nine years. The last day of school, we have a long lunch. The last day of school, the last day before, before break, Festivus break. They have a long lunch. And in this long lunch, it's like a 45 minute lunch. And I've been showing the documentary on festivals for years. Last year, there were about 60 people crammed in here to watch the documentary on festivals. What? Well, Ask anybody. They were here. Ask people from last year. Almost all, most of my classes came. The documents. You know what the documentary is? No. Can you give me a little summary? Hmm? I don't know. It's a documentary. It's a documentary. All right. So, yeah, there were one year we had. One year we had open. They used to get curtain. I can't remember what we did, but we were able to watch it. But I think maybe we, well, we used to connect the TV into both rooms. Uh, we said TV. All right, so let's go take your notes out. Let's go and finish up that era issue. Where do we finish it? Where do we stop? Yeah, you're going to tell us the Republican. So we got the. No, nothing? Yeah, did we get to him? No, you didn't. So, oh. like, where are we stopping? So, we got the no nothings, which is a party. What is it, what's their view on Nate? Um, what was Nate doesn't mean? They're anti what? Catholic. Well, an immigrant, but basically Catholic. And where was the uh, Civil War? What state? Beautiful Kansas. Who's been to Kansas? Beautiful, isn't it? 
And then, so the big issue was bleeding Kansas, popular sovereignty, the Kansas Nebraska Act. And so the Republican nominee would be whom? And Fremont, after the slogan was free soil, free labor, free speech. Yes, Fremont. Who <laughs> <laughs> was it? <laughs> and they were only on the ballot in what section? Yeah, only in the north. Now, there were only about five or six percent of the population of the north were abolitionists, but they joined the Republican because where else are you going to go? The Republican Party was a free soil party. And so, when the election came out, Buchanan would win. The Democrat would win. The Know Nothings got third, so they would kind of go away. They would be split north and south. But look how well the Republicans did. Actually, Know Nothings got a lot of votes too, didn't they? But remember, the Electoral College is what counts. 1.3 million. And only in the north. No slave state had Republicans on their ballots in 1856. None of them did. And yet they won these states. A dope face was elected president. A dope face was elected, but Democrats and the South were terrified. They could do the math. What if they got all of these states in the North? The population was three times, or over, over two times, North to South. It'd be possible for a president to win in the Electoral College and not even be on the ballot in the South. They're scared. 1856 led to a lot of Southerners saying, we might get a National Republican Party, and now we're in trouble. And so with that, Dred Scott case came the very next year. Dred Scott versus Sanford. Dred Scott was a slave. Dred Scott and his wife Harriet were slaves. They were taken to Wisconsin and Illinois that were free territories and states. When Sanford died and, and willed them to his wife and willing to his wife, it went, they said abolitionists brought it up that they should be free because they lived most of their life in a free state. It went all the way to the Supreme Court saying they should be free because they lived in free states. Roger Tani, who is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, appointed by uh, Andrew Jackson. And yes, that's the picture they always show of Tani. And yes, it's a little scary. I know it's Tani, but look at there should be a like Taney or Tanny. And he thought if the problem of the country is sectionalism, the North and South divide over slavery, the Chief Justice, he thought he could solve the problem with one ruling. And so he decided to make this an overarching and very radical decision that will divide the country all through the election. Dred Scott's going to be huge. And it said these main elements. Number one, blacks are not citizens. You notice I didn't say slaves, I said blacks. So just a blanket statement, only white people are citizens in this country. There was no definition of citizenship in the United States. None. Number two, oh, they should have thrown it out there. Blacks can't, they could not sue them. It should have been thrown out. But it's called Star City to see it. He, or to say it. he kind of put a ruling on it. Next, slaves are property. And property can be brought anywhere, anywhere, protected by the Constitution. Therefore, all the laws that restricted slavery were unconstitutional, specifically the Missouri Compromise or the Northwest Ordinance. This is a, an example of judicial review. Remember that court case, Marbury versus Madison? This is the most important case of judicial review in that century. It is a shockingly radical decision. Because these laws, that remember that set of 3630, and this said no states north of the Ohio will have slave codes, thrown out. What he thought was, if we open up at least this area <coughs> to slaves, the sectional crisis is over. The north-south divide will go away, and Tani will save the Union. That's what he sincerely believed in this radical and convoluted decision. Did it work? Everybody was mad. Northerners were furious that they're going to have to open up their states to slavery. And what were Southerners mad about? That Northerners were mad. Literally. 
How dare you? You should open up your states to slavery. There should be slaves in Indiana, etc. This was so divisive. Everybody will be talking, Dred Scott, Dred Scott, Dred Scott. So then with that, both are, oh, which political party in the North would be benefited by this anger over this decision? In the North, you said, who you said? The Republican Party would be benefited in the North, and the Democratic Party became more of a Southern party because of this decision. And so, a horrible economic panic hit, and that's part of the reason why you know, people are already insecure because there was an economic recession going in the Civil War. People forget this because they think about all the other issues. We're not going to go into detail after uh, next year. I'll tell you about how panics happen. So we're jumping right to this big issue. Just right now, there's a horrible panic. And then, in the state of Illinois, was a closely watched Senate race. Now, Abraham Lincoln would jump in as a Republican. Nobody really knew Lincoln. Everybody knew Douglas. Douglas was the guy who broke up the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and he wanted to be president. Now, state assemblies choose senators. So they did seven debates to convince people to either vote for Republicans or Democrats for the state assembly. Today, voters pick senators, but that wouldn't happen until the first election would be 1914. So, seven states, and in it, the big issue was, and get this down, Dred Scott. That's all they talked about, Dred Scott, Dred Scott, Dred Scott. Because people in Illinois, there's Illinois scared they might have to have slave codes. They're also proof of this within the Civil War. This is where Lincoln would make his fam very famous statement during this debate. A little bit of a Daniel Webster mixed in. A house divided against itself cannot survive forever half slave and half free. He's basically saying this country cannot survive with this huge sectional issue. Of course, Southerners thought that meant uh, they're going to get rid of slavery in the South. Lincoln would get a little bit of good publicity, but Douglas would be the easy victor in the state assembly. But Douglas was going to run for president. So on Dred Scott, he tried to straddle the fence. And he would give what would, in Freeport, Illinois, the Freeport Doctrine. The Freeport Doctrine. And in the Freeport Doctrine, it said that states and territories, if they don't want slavery, don't pass slave codes. So yeah, Dred Scott opened up Illinois or other northern states to slavery, but it won't happen if you don't pass slave codes. Remember the slave codes. You have to have those to have slavery. So he's thinking, okay, Southerners won't be mad because he's not going against Dred Scott. Northerners won't, won't be mad because he's not saying, or he's saying you don't have to have, to have slaves. Who do you think is going to be mad about this? Everybody. Northerners are mad at, at Douglas because he would not say Dred Scott was wrong wrongly ruled, and Southerners were mad that he didn't come out and say, I'm all for Dred Scott, and this infuriated Southerners. Southern Democrats are not going to trust Douglas, the most prominent politician of the 1850s. I like that picture. Isn't that kind of cool? Most of the pictures, they look so stiff at this time, kind of like that. Kind of looks like he's like, I don't know. That was cool. And then this man would come back. That's me, 2005. You notice his hand? He is pledging that he will end slavery. So I'm, he's making a pledge. And by the way, he's kind of shaking. And so that's where you get that. Hard not to shake. If you think about the fascist salute, no, not yet. No fascism yet. In fact, you know when the Pledge of Allegiance in the 1920s started to be read in schools, you know how they pledged the flag? They didn't do this. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Okay, so moving on. That got a little awkward in World War II. Yeah. So with that, John Brown. He would grow a beard, and his plan was, politicians aren't going to do anything. I'm going to do it myself. He would raid. He would raid Harper's Ferry an arsenal in Virginia, now West Virginia. 
And this rate, two basic elements. First off, these tired of Southern bullying. The federal government won't do anything. They're dominated by the South. They'll have to end slavery himself. And that means trigger a slave rebellion. The greatest fear of the South. Now, they would carry some rifles, but it was an arsenal. Harper's Ferry, they made muskets there. And so they would capture those weapons. They even brought pikes. So this is a picture of it, but it's actually a 14-foot long pike with a, with a blade at the end to give to slaves to trigger a rebellion. So capture the weapons, and then get out of the mountains and go to the plains of Virginia and start a rebellion. Now, this is the greatest fear of the South. And there's nothing more bloody and horrible than a slave rebellion. And to be honest with you, he didn't really want this. He said it, but he wanted something else. Because when they got to Harper's Ferry, and this is a picture uh, showing them when they're, uh, they're basically holed up into the firehouse there, this brick building there. They went in there, took the arsenal, and then stayed. They didn't leave. And that would allow, we have, the United States have a tiny little army, a few soldiers, and we have tiny marine forts, which are just infantrymen on ships, man. And some cavalry rode to Harper's Ferry and quickly surrounded the arsenal, or I'm sorry, the firehouse right there where Brown and his followers were. They were led by Robert E. Lee, who was a colonel in the army. He happened to be the highest ranking officer around. And, and his label. But Brown stayed. He never left. And so no one's going to join. There's no plantations in the mountains. By the way, if you get a chance, there's some poetry from there. It is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my life. And I'm not exaggerating. I thought it'd be cool. Because it has the Shenandoah River and the Potomac and the Seano Canal and a bunch of mountain valleys all come together and it rains there. So there's trees. But I really thought it'd be great. It was unreal how cool and beautiful it was. And it's a national park, the town. So there's no cars in it. You only can walk, but they, they make it like you're you walk in 1859. That's what it's set up. Like still the year of the uh, of the rain. If you get a chance, I'm not kidding. Go. Now it's, in, it's West Virginia now, but it's great. They would eventually break down the doors of the arsenal and take them by storm. Half of Brown's men would be killed or wounded, including Brown. And Brown, it was pretty clear, he never wanted a slave rebellion. He wanted to be a martyr, meaning he wanted to do what? Die for the cause. Die for the cause. He wanted to bring or make the United States know what happened. He'd be tried for treason, and at the trial, he turned it into a fight against slavery. He would be, of course, convicted and condemned. Here's a picture of his arsenal surrounded by militia from all over Virginia. And I should add, if he's from Virginia, a regiment of militia from Richmond came and would have a member in it who was one of the greatest actors of that era, and six years later would become one of the most infamous criminals in American history. John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth just happened to be there. What did he do? So this is John Brown's last statement. He didn't actually read the end of the guard, but it's a great statement. So what's the crime? Hmm? The crime is slavery. What's the land? What's that? Someone said, the South. not just the South, the, the whole United States, the U.S. allowed this, U.S. laws, the North profit from this. Everyone got that? He said it's the U.S. The United States did that. The United States allowed that. Even if there were no slaves in the South, they profited and allowed this system. He's predicting what here? He's predicting the war. He would be executed. And last we did that, I want to get really quick. This was so divisive. A couple of different things about it. First off, in the South, it seemed to confirm their ideology of the positive good theory of slavery. No slaves came, so they must love slavery. Well, no slaves came, but there's no plantations there. And they also made the next step. All free soilers are John Browns. They're all John Browns, their point of view. They're all lying about just no slave in the territory. They don't just want to end slavery. They want to cut our throats in the middle of the night. That meant what party? is a party made up solely of John Browns. The Republican Party or John Browns. So to the Southern point of view, we're electing traitors if we elect Republicans. Remember, John Brown's a traitor. And then they strengthened, oh, 
codes, but I think the militia might matter. In the North, there were rallies in support, and the song John Brown's Body would be sung by Union soldiers as they marched to war. And it seemed to Northerners to confirm their Republican ideology of free labor. Look at the brutal system of slavery compared to ours. Ideology, Dred Scott, John Brown, those are three of the biggest triggers to secession. Now, I know what you're thinking, and I agree. 